Hey guys, Vipin here again. Uh, today's topic we're going to talk about joint stock companies, and this is very important for the first PUC students. Okay, I am going to give you a lot of information when it comes to joint stock companies because you guys need to know this in detail. It's very, very important from the examination point of view. And being commerce students, you should know a lot about joint stock companies, why they're so important and what makes them so unique, what makes them so different. Okay, now, firstly, let's look at why people would want to go about setting up a company. Okay, why bother going about setting up a company when you can take up sole proprietorship, when you can take up partnership, or when you can take up other forms like, for example, cooperative societies. Okay. Now, why would you take up a company? The big reason for that would be the benefits you would get and the privileges that you would get in companies which are not available in other forms of organizations. Okay. If I were to consider a partnership, the maximum number of members I would be able to get is about 20. Okay. And now when you have 20 members in a partnership firm or 20 partners in a partnership firm, the amount of work you can do is limited to only that 20. And now 20 people, the amount of capital they can contribute will be quite less. If I were a partner in a partnership firm, I would consider contributing, I would, uh, I would not really consider, sorry, to contribute a large amount of money because one, there is unlimited liability associated with it. If I were to invest money from my savings and if that were to lead to a big loss, I would have to go about liquidating my personal assets in order to repay that loss. So that's a pretty big chance that I need to take when I go about making investments through a partnership firm. Now, all that problems can be avoided if you go about setting up a company. Okay. Usually how it would start is if you are starting a business, you would start off as a sole proprietor. And as the business grows, you realize you need more people to run the business. So you get another person to do it, you have partnership there, and there will come to a phase in the business uh, life cycle where even that partner is not capable of doing, you need more and more members to do the job. And when you need more and more people to do the job, you need more capital, and hence you have that company form of ownership. So that's the reason why you would go about doing. Now, as I describe more of the features of companies, you will see why that sets them aside from the rest. Okay, now let's move on to features of a company. This could come for a 10 mark question. The number of points that you have in this is quite less, but the explanation that you need to give in this is quite a lot. Okay, so bear with me. And this is going to get very interesting from now on. When it comes to one important feature of a company, you have legal formation. Legal formation here refers to, unlike sole proprietorship or a partnership, you can't go about setting up your business by just putting up a board in front of your home. You need to go through the regulations and the provisions of Companies Act 1956. That's what they mean when it comes to legal formation. When you want to start a company, you need to follow Companies Act. When you want to shut down a company as well, you need to go through the procedure which is mentioned in Companies Act and only then can you shut it down. Now that's not so the case when it comes to a sole proprietorship nor is it when it comes to a partnership. When it comes to a sole proprietorship and a partnership, you could shut down your business and you need not inform the uh, High Court about the closure of your business. You could very well just shut shop and shut down the business overnight. Okay, so legal formation here refers to going through the procedures of Companies Act. Now, in case you are aware, Companies Act is one of the lengthiest acts in Government of India, only second to the Constitution, you could say. Then there is everything that is mentioned in Companies Act, the do's and don'ts, how managers are supposed to work, how directors are supposed to work, the role of a company secretary, all those provisions you need to follow when you go about setting up a company. So you can see the, uh, the long list of procedures that is there when it comes to starting a company, which is not so the case when it comes to a partnership or a sole proprietorship. Then artificial person. Now the company is considered to be an artificial person. 
which means it has some of the privileges that you and I have but it is uh, it is present up to an extent now an artificial person here refers to although the company is considered as a non-living entity it is able to open a bank account in its own name it's able to op take up an insurance policy in its own name in fact when you are if you get your first offer letter from a company you will notice that the name of the company says for example hsbc india private limited is hiring followed by your name here you have an artificial person which is in fact hiring you you don't have the name of an hr person who is mentioned in the offer letter saying that this guy is in fact hiring you you have the name of a company that is mentioned when it comes to artificial person okay now the like i said the benefits you and i have when it comes to taking up an insurance policy or a bank account or even more importantly entering into a contract all that is something which a privilege only a company can get okay then perpetual existence we've all come across companies which are decades generations old in india alone you have quite a few companies that go back to our pre independence era like for example the tata group is there state bank of india is there and of course itc indian tobacco company all these companies are date back to india's pre independence era so as you can see these companies are in fact generations old now what happens here is because even when a person in the top management were to retire say the ceo the director vice president anyone you will always find someone who is able to take who is able to replace them and carry on with the working of a business it's not so the case with a sole proprietor proprietorship or a partnership firm in a sole proprietorship or a partnership firm you don't really see people do something which they refer to as head hunting uh, head hunting contrary to the uh, to the name which is pretty barbaric as it sounds you don't really see the partners or the sole proprietor look for people who can replace him and carry on the business if there is no one able to continue they all wind up uh, that's not so the case when it comes to a joint stock company you will find someone who is able to carry on the business uh, one thing which i find very happy about this particular point is deutsche bank is in fact being headed by an indian uh, according to me a german bank and you know how germans are when it comes to brown skinned and any other race in fact historically speaking you have a brown guy in fact heading that bank which is pretty a uh, cool if you think of it you have an indian in fact a rajasthani in fact who happens to be heading that bank anshu jain who is heading that institution so there even though you are not able to find anyone uh, to run uh, uh, run the company from your own country that doesn't limit your options you have many places where you can look at and you can always find someone who is able to carry on the business then a uh, separate legal entity the owners of the company and the company are considered to be two different entities although remember they are considered different entities the company works because of the influence of the directors and the actions of the directors however if you were to come across a news article that says uh, say for example uh, itc plans to increase hiring by 5000 every year that is itc is adding 5000 jobs in a year it is in fact the hr director of itc who is given out the statement he's the he's the brain behind the logic that we want more people to uh, work for itc it is not itc in itself that's taking up the decision so here is a case where even though the directors are the people who are actually taking the decision the company is the one which is which is acting through or acting upon these decisions you will never really see advertisements wherein they say uh, bill gates is launching the new windows 8 you'll always see things like microsoft is launching windows 8 not the people who are in fact part of the company which is mentioned when it comes to these things happening so there that's what they mean when it comes to separate legal entity then common seal now when you want to authorize transactions when you want to validate transactions the way in which you validate transactions today is through common seals now historically speaking when you had common seals common seals were once upon a time were which were given to noblemen if you look up look back at the old english history you had lords you had earls dukes uh, people like them if you have seen in fact uh, pirates of the caribbean 
uh, I part, part two, if I'm not wrong, uh, they show one of the lords who has got a pretty thick ring on his right hand. He melts wax on an envelope and he embosses his insignia from that ring onto that molten wax. And that's able to provide the signature which is supposed to make Captain Jack Sparrow a free man. Uh, by the way, this is my second Pirates of the Caribbean reference in my videos. I pretty, I'm, I'm a big fan of the franchise. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, that's a case wherein you have uh, common seals being used from such a long time. In Pirates of the Caribbean, they've actually shown the East India Company in the movie. Now, when Jack Sparrow is getting his freedom, it's in fact the East India Company who is hunting him all these days. And the Lord, once he puts the common seal onto that envelope, uh, Jack Sparrow happens to be a free man. A common seal is a way to say that you approve a particular transaction. A company being a non-living entity cannot put its own signature. So you have a common seal as a substitute for this. Common seals were once upon a time a molten man wax insignia. From then it's evolved to a rubber stamp and today people take up digital signatures as well. Now thanks to a recent uh, West Bengal High Court ruling, a common seal is not required to be put, uh, put across by every director of the company. Now in this day and age, it's very difficult to find all the directors in one place to put across a particular signature. According to the West Bengal High Court, they've said, if you are able to put, if one director is able to put the signature and other directors are aware the transaction is happening, then that's considered okay under the law. You need not go about having any everyone, anyone and everyone signing across on that particular transaction. Okay, so common seals today have become digital signatures is what I could say. Now, why is it so important? Consider that you are being hired by a company. You will find the common seal of say the HR director on the bottom of the uh, offer letter. That's a way to say that the company recognizes you as being hired. I have come across n number of cases where people have been defrauded by people who, who by these agents who have gone about printing fake offer letters. Uh, recently, I came across a story where KPMG, some agents, unauthorized of course, had in fact printed fake offer letters of KPMG. It was just like any other letter, the KPMG logo on top, the registered office on top, and the details which went on to mention there, we are going about hiring you, please report on this particular date. And these people have defrauded and given KPMG a bad name. In fact, uh, they've defrauded a lot of people here of course, and they've given KPMG a bad name when they've done this. So always check whether the common seal is there when you enter into a transaction with the company or any contract with the company. That's a way to say the company recognizes the transaction and only if they recognize the transaction does the transaction actually become valid. Then, limited liability, an excellent feature. A very, very excellent feature because thanks to limited liability, companies are able to protect themselves from any losses that may happen. Now you saw in the recent past how even gigantic software companies like Microsoft have come out with some pretty shitty products. Like for example, they came out with Windows Vista. Uh, prior to that, they came out with uh, an MP3 player called Zoom. All these products did miserably. Now, If you had Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer as partners doing these products, these guys would have had to bear a pretty fat loss and that could pretty much bankrupt them. Now since it's Microsoft that is actually having to bear the loss, Microsoft's liability is limited to the assets which may be there in the company. That is in the worst case scenario of course. Okay, so that's what they mean when it comes to limited liability. Uh, one more here you could say uh, General Motors which recently the American government gave them a big fat bailout. For generations together General Motors has been making terrible cars. Okay. But over a course of time, the company had to declare bankruptcy. They had to go about liquidating their assets. But none of the assets of the directors who were in fact behind the business were considered for uh, the problems that went on across over a course of time. That is, uh, the company had to bear the loss and the directors could just sit back. Even though you could say these guys are the people who are behind, who are the brainchild behind those bad decisions. So that's what they mean by limited liability. Moving on. Uh, types of companies here could come for a 10 mark question as well. You need to know these topics in detail. Alright, now firstly 
you have separated the companies from two two different categories based on ownership and nationality the first one that is a private company now i'll give you the information of a private company of before the 2013 companies are uh, at amendments bill so there's been a lot of changes when it comes to features of a private company but i'll still give you the old information on that because that's unfortunately what the pu board only knows so a private company is a type of company where you have just a minimum of two people required to start a business the total number of members in a private company is about 50 minimum capital required is 1 lakh now a private company is usually considered as an extended form of a family business okay a very good example of a private company is mtr mtr although is generations old it still continues to be a family business that is you have the mayas family who is in fact heading mtr even though their generations old the way in which they work is extremely conservative you don't see them be as aggressive as how these other food and beverage companies like jubilant food works are a uh, private company is in fact very very conservative they like to keep their operations small uh, pretty much like a family business itself however unlike a regular family business a hindu undivided family these guys have got the benefit of limited liability then a public company or a public limited company here in a public limited company the total amount of capital that you can contribute is sorry the minimum amount of capital you can contribute is 5 lakhs okay the minimum number of members in a public limited company is 7 okay public limited companies don't have any cap on the total number of members that can be there in this comp- in this business you could have in fact lakhs of uh, lakhs together people who are part of a public limited company in fact that's what happens to these large companies like sbi or reliance or the tata group the number of shareholders in these companies runs to lakhs or even crores in fact okay then a department undertaking this is a type of company which is owned by the government of india more importantly this is in fact owned by or looked after by a particular minister in government of india okay a good example for this of course would be the indian railways okay the indian railways is in fact one of the oldest department undertakings in the country apart from that you even have the post office of india which is also categorized as a department undertaking in both the cases you have a minister who is heading the organization and not any particular director who is in fact looking after these organizations then statutory companies these are the companies in fact who are regulating industries for example you have sebi which looks after the capital markets the stock exchanges and companies as well up to a big extent statutory companies are extremely powerful institutions no matter what decision they come about with you don't see any politician go about objecting towards their decisions objecting towards what they have to say okay a good example for this would be uh the way uh, the way sebi caught hold of the sahara group when it comes to the uh, poor information that they provided when it comes to uh, the debenture subscription in the recent years now here you did not have any politician who went about interfering and saying that what sebi did was too wrong was wrong and sebi should not have been so aggressive in the way they treated the sahara, the sahara group you you do not come across cases where the any politician or any authority goes about objecting towards what a statutory company does another example would be try telecom regulatory authority of india in fact if you remember when they uh, reduced the number of smss we could send from uh, unlimited to just about 100 per day you did not have a single organization uh, especially students here who went about making objection saying that we need to be texting non stop and you guys are interfering with that uh interfering in our lives okay then psus are public sector undertakings please do not confuse yourself between a public sector undertaking and a public limited company okay a public sector undertaking could either be registered as a private limited company or a public limited company a psu is a company wherein the minimum amount of control by the government of india or the karnataka government is about 51% a good example of a psu is bmtc okay or you have state bank of india 
or even for example uh, the subsidiaries of state bank of india itc all that is in fact classified as a psu psu companies do not operate for the sake of providing service they are in fact as uh, uh, keen on profit motive as any other company in the market uh, for example bsnl uh, they are as competitive as airtel pun intended remember that so they are as competitive as airtel or any other company in the telecom business then you have holding companies a holding company is wherein one company provides share capital for another company but here remember when the other company the larger company when it provides share capital to the smaller company the larger company doesn't go about interfering in the management affairs of the smaller company okay a good example for this would be ibm which is in fact funding tesla motors okay ibm is funding tesla motors but here IBM is not interfering in the work of Tesla. If Tesla decides to come out with a small car, contrary to the regular sports electric cars as they make, you may not really come across IBM interfering in this matter. Uh, one more example to this would be Edelweiss Securities, which was the holding company for Manapuram before Edelweiss withdrew their investment. Uh, and the reason why Edelweiss withdrew their investment is because they got extremely fat returns. by investing in manapuram in the early days makes me wish that i had done that rather than edelbees but anyway moving on subsidiary uh, subsidiary companies are those wherein okay this gets a little complicated so you need to uh, pay attention to this consider the tata group uh, tata motors in fact tata motors has got a subsidiary which happens to be tata jlr now a subsidiary company is also referred to as a sister concern okay now why would you go about setting up a subsidiary a smaller company under a larger company one big reason for that is you can take up specialization when you do that but the other reason they do that which is not really disclosed is that you can save your own skin when you were to get into any problems with that subsidiary company Firstly I'll tell you how Tata Motors and JLR have been cleverly structured in this procedure. When Tata acquired JLR they knew very well that it's not going to be a easy business to do. Okay because if you look at it India is still an emerging market when it comes to buying automobiles like Jaguar and Land Rover. They are quite expensive uh, products in fact. You don't really have a lot of people who are ready to buy this so easily. even after it's been quite a few years since they acquired it you still see jlr which is making losses okay now let's assume that these losses were to go on for several years there are two things that could happen now tata motors can say we are unable to go about continuing uh, bearing the loss and they could eventually come out with a press statement saying that jlr is going to shut down however if tata motors uh, had a branch a division within itself wherein they were making jlr like how they are making indica sumo storm all that in if that were to be the case tata motors would be forced to in fact protect jlr and have jlr continue okay to protect jlr and have it continue since jlr is now considered as a subsidiary they can in fact say it's a different company altogether i don't see why we should go about helping it out in fact you saw the same thing which happened when it comes to uh, united breweries and the Uh, and the uh, diageo deal and kingfisher as well kingfisher is in fact a subsidiary of ub group but when diageo was giving a large amount of funding to ub group not a single paisa was in fact given to kingfisher uh, even though kingfisher was in some severe financial discomfort there that's the reason why you go about setting up a subsidiary you do this so that you can go about protecting your uh, protecting yourself from any big fat loss in the future okay now chartered companies chartered companies are those which have been set up by the royal crown you will find quite a few chartered companies in these monarchy run countries like for example saudi uh, kuwait quite a few of the uh, uh, quite a few of the gulf countries in fact have got a lot of chartered companies there in fact one of the first companies which were to be set up in india the english east india company was also a chartered company okay mostly if you look at chartered companies were set up for two reason or two reasons one uh, for the purpose of taking up slavery and secondly to take up exploration and colonization work okay then 
nationality uh, based on the origin of these companies you can classify them into indian or foreign uh, indian companies are like sbi itc reliance uh, all this get categorized as an indian company companies like for example nokia siemens yeah you can giggle at the name siemens 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 i am not sure who decided to come out with such a name a lot of men are pretty are quite giggling at that name right now all that gets categorized as a foreign company okay um there is a little bit more when it comes to this topic i will do that in another video all right i hope i made the topics clear if you have any queries if you have any doubts do leave it in the comment section below okay somewhere there uh, yeah somewhere there i think the comment section is okay uh, leave a comment there and do go about subscribing to my videos okay Thank you guys have a nice day